Welcome to another episode of the Emetophobia Free Podcast. Today we are joined by two lovely ladies who've never had a three-person podcast before. He's very exciting. So welcome to Ruth Mitchell and welcome to Emma Rogers. Hello, ladies. How are you? Hello. Great to be here. Very well. (laughs) Fabulous. Ruth is one of our experienced Thrive Programme coaches and Emma Rogers is also a Thrive Programme coach who is due to be taking bookings from October 2024. And they are here today to talk all about neurodivergence and going through the Thrive Programme. So over to you, ladies. Who is going to start us off? Brilliant. Thanks so much, Michelle. It's really exciting to be here with Emma. And I took Emma through the Emotophobia Free Programme and we'd been discussing what it was like and we really wanted to talk to you today about neurodivergence and our experiences of what that means and why it's relevant to the program so emma can you just tell us a little bit about your story your your emetophobia story before the program and what brought you to the thrive program yeah, so um, I suffered with emetophobia, which is a sort of fear, fear of vomiting myself or anybody else vomiting. Um, I suffered with this for over 36 years, um, and alongside that comes extreme anxiety. Um, and yeah, it just used to affect absolutely everything, every sort of thought in my head, every minute of the day, it was whether almost just protecting myself or trying to protect myself from vomiting or, or, or being sick or being around anybody else. Um, so, yeah, that was why I went through the program. Um, and I am dyslexic as well. So um, struggle a little bit. I can read, but struggle with like the reading and processing of information and retaining information. So, um that was always a little bit more of a challenge um, for me, um, but yeah, yeah. And you and you did you did so well, didn't you? You did so well, in fact, that not only have you overcome your emetophobia, but you were the thriver of the year last year, sharing your story of of the incredible success that you'd had. And I just wanted to sort of go back a little bit, Emma. I'm really interested in how. The, the, the dyslexia that is is your neurodivergence, how that impacted on you when you were going through school? Yeah, so initially when, when I was at school through primary and things, I don't think I really noticed it that much. I think it was coming towards the end of primary that I started to really sort of maybe just almost feel a little bit different, like sort of feeling like my peers were, were sort of more able in a sense than me um with with I suppose the the academic work that they were doing and things so I think moving on as as work got harder and things and the fact that I was just getting a little bit more aware that um I was struggling to remember things really um and just yeah so then I started to just lose confidence I think Mm -hmm. just um just feel a bit of a failure in in comparison to, to my peers and things so I think, um, but at that time, I didn't know I was dyslexic. I didn't know what it was. I hadn't really had much experience with anybody um, dyslexic. I think nowadays as well, it's a a lot more talked about and and things, dyslexia Mm. and neurodiversity. Um, So, yeah, so going through school and things, it it, it was challenging for me um, academically. and nobody really picked it up, to be honest, at school. It wasn't till my later years, I think, oh, probably about six years, seven years ago, that, that I actually got a diagnosis of yeah. dyslexia. And it was after having children. Um, so, well, both of my sons are, are dyslexic. And I found out, I knew I could tell that, that my oldest son was, was dyslexic from quite an early age. So I had him screened and assessed. And after that, I thought, you know what, I'm going to get myself assessed um, and things. And that's when I suppose I started to become more aware of everything and and trying to work out the way I learn. But I just had no self-confidence. Yeah. And and, I I think that's so interesting what you say. The the British Dyslexia Association, when you look on their website, they say about 10 percent of the population 
is dyslexic. That's quite a high percentage, isn't it? And then when we think about all of the other more more common types of neurodivergence, autistic spectrum disorder, ADHD, um, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, it's a lot of people, isn't it? And, And something that I found really interesting, Emma, thinking about what you're talking about, but then also thinking about a lot of the other clients that I've worked with who are neurodivergent both adults and children is what you were talking about with that low self-esteem and a lot of the research shows that people who are neurodivergent are more likely to experience depression to experience high levels of anxiety but also to experience that low self-esteem and low self-esteem is so important isn't it in terms of I always think of it like a seesaw that if you have low self-confidence and low self-esteem anxiety is going to be higher so I'm really interested in thinking about your dyslexia specifically and then your emetophobia. Do you think that your dyslexia was relevant or in some way a part of your emetophobia? Um, that's a really interesting uh, question, Ruth, because actually looking back and obviously coming out the other side of, of the programme, um, definitely now I definitely think it was a really significant piece in in the jigsaw so to speak I think um yeah just huge underconfidence I suppose just Mm. feeling of like failure um and things and I just think that impacted so much so I definitely think Mm. it it was uh, a key part of of the jigsaw alongside a lot of other things that that sort of make up the emetophobic sort of thoughts and things um but but looking back yeah definitely and now so I'm me- just so much more confident <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah yeah so so many of these things that it's it's all entermeshed isn't it it's like a massive tangle of all different colors of wool all mixed up together and the the experiences that you have growing up are what inform those lenses, the way that we perceive the world. And I can only imagine that particularly as it wasn't recognised or diagnosed while you were going through school, it must have felt really, really tricky for you. And you, I imagine, and I know actually from some of the conversations that we've had before that you, you've you said to me before, I've, I've never read a book. And we, we can carry those things with us, can't we? So how did those beliefs that you had created through your earlier life how did those then specifically impact on you when you came to the point of saying right I've had enough of this emetophobia I recognize that I don't have to live my life like this but how am I going to change it what 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 did that do initially when you first discovered the emetophobia free program how did that affect you so that that again is very sort of significant really so I found out about the emetophobia program I think around 2017 2018 um, and I was at sort of a real crisis point sort of mentally I was struggling to go out I was sort of sick from work I was having panic attacks there was all sorts of things going on and um, somebody had recommended the Thrive program to me and the emetophobia um free sort of, uh, manual so I I purchased it and thought oh I'll have a look and, and see how, how I get on to be honest because I was in such a sort of poor state with my mental health I like a lot of people felt like I know other people have got over it but I'm not sure I'll ever get over it that was my sort of mindset now I got the book and like you said I've never read a book from front to start. I can read, but um, I've never picked up a book um, and read it. So I got the manual. I read a couple of pages of it. And from that moment, I knew that this program was incredible. It just was different. And it was simple to understand. And they just got it. Like nobody. I mean, I've done over 20 odd years of seeing lots and lots of um, different professionals, uh, psychologists, hypnotherapists, I've done C, 
green tea, all sorts of um, other sort of therapies. And nobody really got it. And this manual, you opened it. And from the minute you sort of start reading, you think, wow, this is different. This this is incredible. So I knew all of that just from reading those couple of pages. And then I just don't think, again, it was the sort of processing of the information for me and just being in quite a low sort of place of the feeling of I'm not sure this is going to work for me. So I just, the manual literally sat by my bed right up until I um, came to the Thrive program and wrote in, well, yeah, last year, and wrote in and just said, is there any help? I'm dyslexic. Is there any other way? Is there any like audio sort of books? Is there anything else that, that you can do to help me? Because I'm, I'm still in a really bad place and I really, really want to do this program. And um, yeah, and that's when, when I got the call from you, Ruth. And that was um, absolutely game changing. And again, just from the moment I started chatting to, to you about it, it was um, like, yeah, the program just gets it. So I was just like, okay, this could work. And now there's, there's videos to back it up, um, which is amazing. And for me, with, with my sort of slower processing and trying to remember what I'm learning, the videos and the check-ins weekly with, with you as a coach just were really helpful. I mean, I did watch the videos. I, I put them on when I was going for a dog walk or just when I was hoovering or when I was doing anything around the house and I would play them a few times but that's how it sort of chipped away and how I started to almost train my brain I think to to start remembering the information and do you know what it's so interesting the program is so interesting it, it's fun and it really catches you and um, nothing's mm. ever really done that to me before so although my health my mental health was in such a poor state actually those key little things were game changing for me having having a coach to, to help me through the program and also if there was something that I didn't get Ruth I would check in with you and say oh I just can't quite get my head around this bit it's not quite falling into place and you would go right okay let's try it like this so mm -hmm. there was there was alternatives like you can you were really good at like drilling into to yeah giving me an alternative to do so mm -hmm. um that was really beneficial really beneficial mm -hmm. It, again it's oh god we're gonna say so much it's so interesting I, I do find it also fascinating that that feeling of mine is different to anybody else's I think having any sort of mental illness or poor mental well-being is still even though we're far more aware of it it can still be so isolating and so many of the people that I speak to particularly with emetophobia they don't tend to know anybody else with emetophobia so it's very very isolating and even though we are far more aware of neurodivergence and within education, which is where I work alongside this, there is a lot more awareness. I think it can still feel very isolating. And each individual person's experience is unique to them. Just as each of us, whether we're neurotypical or neurodivergent, we are our own unique self and we are different to everybody else. I think somehow for neurotypical people, often that feels a little bit more comfortable. And that feeling of isolation, that feeling of somehow I am different than everybody else can be a real blocker. It can be a real thing that stops people from believing that they can get help. And then when they've got those additional challenges, um, for you that I know we talk quite a lot about it, and you'd said to me often, reading takes me so long, I have to go over and over and over because I find it difficult to process it. For a lot of my clients who are on the autistic spectrum, they are real perfectionists. Oh my goodness. And that is very, very common for people with emetophobia generally. And it's that understanding, isn't it? It's having that 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 understanding of, of how everything sits. And a lot of my clients will say to me, I don't know what the right answer is, Ruth. I don't know how to answer this correctly. And and I'm thinking a lot of that when you when you were sort of because sort of, you had a lot of problems 
not problems, that's the wrong word completely. The belief wall didn't work for you, did it, Emma? No, it, it just didn't work hard. for you. And and we found a way around it. And yeah. that for me is one of the big values of having a coach, absolutely, is when you hit that bit in the program that you don't quite understand or that you understand but you say well what does that mean for me I know what it means in the book I understand the theory but until you can apply it to yourself it's academic and it's having a coach to be able to make sense of it and and like I said so many of my clients who are on the autistic spectrum will say to me I'm struggling with the belief what I don't know what the right answer is and it's being able to understand that there isn't a, a right answer. It's just about being able to explore it, isn't it? Um, and, and, and I think as well, as, as you've already said, Emma, it's having different ways to access the information, isn't it? What, what Was there any single thing that you found particularly helped you to be able to make sense of all of the information? Or was it a combination of being able to access it in lots of different ways? I think it was a combination, um, but the program is, it's just, it's genius, really. The program is so simple to understand. It is so mapped out. It's it's so predictable. So if you follow that pro- the program in the manual, which is what you do, and obviously with the support of a coach for me, but if you follow that, it's so predictable and It's all the research, but just the fact that um, the psychobabble is all gone, so to speak, for me with with a dyslexic brain, like it was just words that I understood, whereas some of the research papers, I read it and I'm like, I can't quite comprehend. And then I have to look up what what the actual word means and then I've forgotten what what I read. So having the program just laid there step by step, really simple, really understandable was amazing but like you say it's definitely a combination the videos for me those visuals with the videos and I know Ruth that you use um sort of um, visuals as well with within within your your coaching and things Mm. so visuals um sort of objects or toys or whatever that that's um really good um to to help it almost makes the book come alive I know that sounds a bit funny but it almost makes the book come alive and make sense as well and so um yeah all of it (laughs) but having having you as a coach to check in with and just to go oh do you know what I didn't quite get this I didn't quite get the belief or what do I do with this you know, almost like a little bit of reassurance initially as well, because I didn't have any self-confidence, because I I didn't go to university or anything, because I always really struggled with, with anything like that. So just having that reassurance, yeah, Emma, you're doing all right. You're on the right track. Mm-hmm. Keep going. You can do it. Even that, you know, just made a, a huge amount of difference to make yeah. you think. And that is what the program does, isn't it? it mm it just builds your your confidence it makes you feel empowered that's that's what what it's about isn't it yeah. you know and yeah. and so it did it, it gave me that confidence and the fact that I could just chip away at it you, you weren't like mm. overloaded with with everything you take you take it chapter by chapter yeah. you don't move on until you've understood that chapter you really get a handle on that and then you move on so um yeah, all of all of that really, and it was it's interesting, and um, because my friend's going through the program, not for emetophobia, she's going through the Thrive program, and, and she's got a coach at the moment, and um, and I was chatting to her yesterday, funnily enough, about this, and and she's got a neurotypical brain, and and we were having a discussion about this, and for my friend, she's like absolutely fascinated by the program, um, the research behind it, she's doing amazing, she's doing so well working through it. But she's really into the research. For me, I didn't even think about the research yeah. because I was just focused on getting through the program, getting through the chapters. Obviously, now uh, being the coach, it's definitely totally really interested in the research, and and I've moved on. But I've learned that I can do that. I've got the skills. I've just got to chip away at it. I've learned so much about me to to be able to just give me the confidence to do anything now and that wouldn't have happened until I went through the program so interestingly that the program's good for everybody 
Mm. It, and it's that that whole understanding the theory thing for some people that's really really important I worked with a young lady she'd done a psychology a level and she was waiting to go to university and to study psychology and and she came to me because of really really significant anxiety and she loved all of that side of it and she connected in with it and and it helped her to understand what was going on and then I've worked with other people who they're, they're not interested in that. They don't really want to know why it works or how it works. They just want to know what to do. And they want to be able to go through and do the things that will help them. And they don't need to know why it's helping them. And and, and I've thought to myself, well, you know, who who is it more successful for? And I've seen great success on both sides. And, and I think it's great that there is that, that depth of, of additional information for people that want it, but you don't have to get bogged down in it. Um, and, and being able to access it, you you recognize really clearly, Emma, some of the, the learning styles that work best for you and some of the ones that for you are tricky linked to your dyslexia. But actually all of us, whether we're neurodivergent or neurotypical, tend to have learning styles that work better for us some of us are, some of us are very visual learners some of us are very social learners um some of us prefer that solitary way of learning and one of the things that i think is so powerful about the program particularly when you're doing it with a coach is that we tick every single one of those boxes so whatever your learning styles are it's really really accessible and you get an opportunity to practice them all of them because ultimately this is about each person learning those skills for themselves and to be able to take that learning away with them and use it for the rest of their life. So we need to be able to do it as a solitary learner, but sometimes we need all of that support initially to be able to do it. It's such interesting stuff, isn't it? It really is. So something else that I'm really interested in, Emma, is has the way that you think about your dyslexia changed from before you did the program to now? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Just um, I'm confident now, you know, and I think that is is the key. Um, and yeah, and my self esteem is is so much better. And so now I just know, yeah, it, it is a bit of a challenge for me, but it's not impossible. And I think I've learned um, to be very patient, which um I don't think I was very patient before I did the program. Um, but also, like, I don't have to be perfect. Like, I'm not aiming to be perfect. It doesn't mean that you can't do it. You've just, I've just learned that I've got to just chip away at things and I will get there. And, and it's a journey, you know, that, that you're on. Um, and so absolutely, 100%, um, I've changed how I think about, about things. Like, don't get me wrong. It's still still a bit of a challenge, but I know that I can do it now, and I just take my time and I just put my effort. effort. Like I, I did, I worked at the program. Like you have to put the effort in. It's all very well having the black and white information there, and it mm. is absolutely life changing. But you do have to work, and I I did put the effort in, but the results are just amazing like well it has absolutely changed yeah. my life yeah. to the point yeah. where I was thinking before I came on this podcast um oh if you ask me something about um like or oh, what was I like when I when I um suffered with emetophobia I struggled to even almost remember how bad it was yeah. and I was like mm. wow that's like that's unheard of from before you know because I was in such a bad place so yeah. you know it is just amazing with mm. with that so definitely much more confident to take on yeah. anything now really yeah yeah it's it's, it's so to do, good to hear sorry go on so, sorry Ruth, I was just gonna say and and because obviously I, I've been doing my training to to, to become mm. um a coach and um like I didn't do my GCSEs at school, but I did them, but I wasn't even bothered about picking up, you know, the results and things like that. I never went to university or anything. 
I had my auntie really helped me through or doing my MVQs for, for my qualifications and things. Um, I've never really like been confident to sort of go through anything like this on my own. And um, mm-hmm. so doing the, the training, um, which is very in depth, you know, mm-hmm. um, yeah, as, as totally, you know, yeah, just something I would never have even contemplated doing before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and the word empowering is 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 so appropriate isn't that it really really is and it's it, listening to you talking and and you talk about such very personal things about how those things have impacted and affected you and all of us have things which we find tricky and difficult all of us have those challenges I don't think there is a human being alive that doesn't have some negative beliefs which they need to work on. And I think it can be really easy, again, for for so many of the people I work with who are neurodivergent, to feel like somehow they are different because they have these challenges. And all of us have challenges it isn't so much for me, it's not so much about what those challenges are. It's about learning how to be proportionate and how to recognise where your your control and your power is. I love the strap line, your life better, because that applies to each of us. And this is never about becoming someone different, is it? It's about being able to say, this is me, And I am working and putting effort into being the best me that is possible, but I don't want to not be me. And and so many of the clients, when they come to me, I think they almost have this, this idea that they will somehow be a different person. And actually, whoever you are is okay and good enough. It's being able to use the best bits. I've, I, I, I'll often say to people, I've got a little saying, lots of people are familiar with the saying, a leopard can't change its spots. And then what I add on to that is that a leopard can learn to appreciate its spots and do the best they can do with the spots they've got. And and that's really what it's about, isn't it, I think? Very much so. So totally. what What else has changed for you? around going through the program it's sort of in in terms you've talked about that that more general increase in your confidence where do you feel that oh just everywhere now well I I can I can cope with things now whereas like I've I've, I realized very early on that I absolutely had no coping skills or or very poor coping skills should I say and I think that that's what you learn through the program those real solid foundations and by breaking down I wouldn't have even thought about what a belief was or a thinking style was or and I think before I, I came to the program it's just something that wouldn't have crossed my mind but when you talk about it and you learn about it and you think oh okay and it all makes sense and then you start questioning your beliefs and looking in, into it all um that's when yeah when everything starts changing so yeah Mm. I've just you know I've just built that skill set and um and it is like learning to drive isn't it or learning to ride a bike so once you've got that skill set um no matter how long it takes you to get it once you've got it you've got it then for life haven't you it's it's a lesson that you've learned you might forget bits here and there or whatever but Mm. at the end of the day you've got that and and I think, yeah, so my life is just improved. I go out, I've, my boys have got boats. Um, I used to be very petrified about going on the boats. In fact, I used to scream probably for the last three years. But this year I've been out and I've been so confident and actually enjoyed myself. Um, I've I've been to a big concert with my friends, um, which I would never have gone anywhere with people. I don't feel socially anxious anymore and that was another thing I don't think I realized how socially anxious I actually was before I completed the program and um and so and the other thing is people I have a lot of people say to me Emma I wouldn't have had any idea that you were you had such poor mental health or that you were an anxious Mm. person because I come across Mm. always people as really bubbly really lively but like inside of me I was just I couldn't think of anything else other than 
trying to protect myself from either getting sick or trying to make my kids wash their hands all the time so they didn't get mm. sick or I couldn't sleep and you know and everything's just improved absolutely everything I don't worry about going anywhere or doing anything now I don't do any safety seeking behaviors anymore and that just dropped naturally like I'd done exposure therapy before this program and uh, it was awful um, and I can remember a counselor actually trying to vomit behind a tree and I was like no thanks and I just freaked you know so this program you don't have to put yourself in any uncomfortable situation and like it was just one day a couple of a few weeks into the program that I noticed oh I'm not alcohol gelling my hands walking around the shops mm. oh my hands aren't peeling anymore my hands used mm. to peel that I'd wash them that much and things mm. and that all just naturally goes from learning the skills that the, the manual teaches you to, to mm. learn you know so my life is yeah. it, it's massive how, how it's mm. changed and and I work ironically um, in education and health with with families um, yeah. and children, and I've done that for over twenty five years. And um, all my colleagues and everything were very protective, almost because I made them very aware of my phobia. Um, looking mm. back on it, that, that that's you know not not a positive thing, but it, it got me through. But I work with so many families that experience poor mental health and. Mm. because of this skill set I just think it's just so important to to get it out there because anybody any age anybody can can do this program and and you get amazing results from it if you work hard yeah yeah absolutely right and it's I think you really for me you really hit the nail on the head with the coping it's about believing that you can cope and once you start to believe that so many things fall into place and as you were talking there was there was two things that I was really thinking about which for me are very very relevant we behavior is the end point and as you said so many people with any sort of phobia or high anxiety create defensive safety seeking and avoidance behaviors in an attempt to cope and what happens often in, in education, in, in lots and lots of different areas, people tend to focus on the behaviour and they try and manage the behaviour. And actually, that's not where the problem is. The behaviour is driven by those, those really difficult feelings and emotions. But we look below that, don't we? It's the thoughts and beliefs that actually drive those things and and that's where the program is so different and I have so many clients come to me as you said and so I've tried this and I've tried that and it's looking at the wrong place the other way I think often that a lot of other therapeutic interventions look at the wrong places when we think again about that seesaw and we think about when anxiety is high we have low self-confidence. A lot of things go and look at the anxiety. Oh, let's try and work on the anxiety. Actually, if we look at the self-confidence and start to build that, and those are nice things, building your self-confidence, those activities are, they feel safe, they feel pleasant, they help you to feel better. And as your self-confidence comes up, the anxiety has to start to go down. Um, So I think often people are, because they have practiced defending, avoiding, running away from, they're so scared to even begin to look at what might help them because their previous experience has been that it isn't helpful. It simply forces them into situations that they don't believe they can cope with. That can really, really be a huge block for people. And certainly for everybody that I've taken through the programme, particularly children and young people, that's like a revelation for them. One of the things they'll say to me is, I'm really scared. I'm really scared about what you will make me do. And just being able to reassure them, I'm like, hey, I can't make you do anything. That's not what this is about. And the look of of relief on people's faces when they realise actually, yeah, this isn't about making me confront what I'm scared of it's about helping me, it's like winding back and helping me not be scared of it anymore. And then it's not even a problem. So that there's so much that goes into this, isn't there? Um, Emma, like we could, 
Oh, sorry, go on. I was on. just going to, sorry, I was just going to add one one thing there, Ruth, just because it, it came into my head there um, whilst you were just saying. I think my biggest sort of turning point and the biggest win almost is is learning and understanding that unintentionally I created the emetophobia I created the anxiety from my unhelpful thinking styles and the beliefs that I was holding and I think once I realized oh that makes sense okay I can understand how that works then you can you can unpick it and it takes time but you can do it but the biggest win is knowing that it's not happening to me like I used to think Mm. oh why have I been dealt this card why have I got a metaphobia it's really rubbish like how how's nobody else I know got this phobia do you know Mm. what I mean why me and that was a turning point knowing actually I've created that unintentionally not on purpose but now I can uncreate it and I think that's key yeah absolutely right and and that's key regardless of who you are of how your brain works, that that is the same for all of us, isn't it? Um, We could talk all day, couldn't we, Emma? We could talk and talk and talk about this. Um, If if we were to sort of summarise, what would your key message be for anybody who is listening to us talking, who is either neurodivergent themselves or who is wanting to help and support somebody who is neurodivergent? What, what's the key message? Um, be brave. Be brave. Mm. And you can do it. Like, you can do it. And just mm. sometimes that first step is, is, is the hardest step. But once you've got a coach on board and once you've got all the support in place, it's all the right support. So, yeah, just be brave and it will change your life. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Absolutely. And and I think for me, the key message is every single one of us is, is unique and different with our own little quirks, our own challenges, our own set of helpful and unhelpful beliefs, regardless of, of how we were brought up, where we were brought up, and how our brains work. All of us bring those things. And all of us can learn how to cope with those things and be the best that we can be brilliant thank you so much Emma amazing what a fabulous podcast thank you both that was absolutely brilliant I really enjoyed listening to you both talking there but I've got one final question if you don't mind for people that are listening to this and thinking okay I'm trying to work through this on my own and actually the belief world's not working for me either how did you work around it give them another out help them out (laughs) Okay, so um, I wrote it out. I literally wrote down the, the sort of questions um, and I just wrote wrote it out, wrote my belief down, wrote down why it was an unhelpful belief and just literally wrote it out in, in a paragraph. And, and every unhelpful belief that I had, I just did the same. I didn't build the wall, but I just evidenced it and, and broke it down in that way. And, and it worked. Mm. fabulous and if you listen to this you can give that one a go if the belief world doesn't work for you and also mind maps are also yeah. equally a good way with my that. training i've mind mapped mm. all the time in the show i've learned to mind map. <laughs> <laughs> fabulous okay well i hope that's been helpful to you listening at home and thank you both so much for joining us it's been incredibly valuable and really enjoyable thank you so much